prepared to try new things or take risks or embrace growth for fear of failure. You see, the fear of failure affects all of us. We are afraid of failing at school, at our job places, in a family. I'm afraid my marriage will fail, my relationship will fail, my friends, your career might fail. There is also even the fear of emotional failure. Your hobbies, you are a footballer, you will break your leg, your football career will end. Your physical health can also fail. Your spiritual life may fail. All of us are in a school of failure, and yet we don't want to talk about it. Failure is a taboo subject. As I said earlier, it is one of the few things all of us excel at and yet, this subject of our expertise is seldom addressed. Especially Christians don't want to talk about failure. Another word for failure, defeat, loss, mistakes, faults, mistakes, setbacks, standards, all of this. Failure is generally frowned upon. Success is the one we all celebrate. And it attracts much attention. Failure is an outcast. He's the one we often blame, reject, scorn, punish. And this happens whether in secular or religious societies. It is one of the reasons why we don't want to talk about failure. We want to talk about success or excellence. And unfortunately, failure tends to stand in the way. In fact, in our lives, there are more records of our failures than our successes. And yet, when we get to talk about ourselves, it is much easier to talk about our successes than sharing our failures. And because we seldom talk about failures, many people out there think that they are alone in their struggles. They are crying for help, but they cannot seem to reach us because they think we are all together. They think we are so perfect, so successful, so spiritual that we don't understand but will rather condemn them. So they choose to hide their painful struggles with failure along with the rest of us, pretending all is well. You see, I became fully aware of this reality after about 10 years ago, I suffered a major failure. After that experience and my public ownership of it, many people started confiding in me sharing with me their own battles. And as a result, I decided to write a book titled Six More Chances, Success in the Midst of Failure. I suffered a major failure. It was painful, very painful. I owned up to it. I did not want to do what many of us pretend. And when I took that ownership, I discovered that it was real Failure is real. The pain, the consequences are real. And when all the fireworks were coming, I kept silent. See, when you, you, you fail, it is perhaps of all kinds of sufferings and afflictions, failure, especially spiritual failure, is the most painful. See, if I have cancer, I can excuse myself by saying it wasn't my fault. If I suffer death in my family, if my house or my farm burns up, there is always a way you can excuse yourself. But if you fail, it is painful because it tends to be self-inflicted. So here was I. I have suffered big time failure. And believe me, when you are a little prominent and you fail, that is when you get to see how people really are. I kept quiet. And all the attacks were coming. Just from nowhere, I got an invitation from a graduating class in molecular biology in one of the major universities in the USA. He said, Dr. Pippin, we want you to come and speak at our graduation event. And we want you to talk about success in the midst of failure. And I said, why are you inviting me to talk about failure? Am I the only one who has failed? <laughs> And the person who wrote to me said, no, no, no. Uh, but we've been watching the way you deal with failure. And we confess that we are all failing, but we don't know how to handle it. 
And so come and share with us some principles on how to deal with failure. So I went and gave my speech. It was quite well received, and some of them said, hey, I want to give me the manuscript, I'll share with my parents, my friends, etc. As a result of this, I ended up publishing it as a book titled, Six More Chances, Success in the Midst of Failure. From the re re results or the, the reception of that, it became an instant best-selling book. And it reminded me that, wow, so this is something we are all struggling with, and yet we are pretending. I guarantee you, see, you all look nice this evening. Prepped up, well-dressed, trimmed, you know. But the truth of the matter is, chances are you are struggling with some form of failure. It may not be spiritual failure. It can be academic failure. Business failure. Your marriage is falling apart. Health failure. What, look, there are different categories of failure. So what I am coming to share with you, how to bounce back after failure, though I, I, I got hit by spiritual failure, the principles apply in many other categories of life. See, everyone, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, young or old, fail. But we only tend to talk about other people's failures. Especially when the people are prominent. Politicians, when they fail. Ministers, when they fail. Sports and movie personalities, when they fail. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth of the matter is, it isn't just the elite who fail. Every one of us, including the ugly and the poor and the oppressed, we all fail. And when it comes to spiritual failure, believe me, Christians fail, Muslims fail, followers of traditional African religion fail, Hindus fail, Buddhists fail. In other words, priests who are leaders of the churches, imams, gurus, pastors, prophets, apostles, even angels fail. So the first thing I want you to do is what's your problem? Failure is part of life. The only person who never failed, according to the Bible, is our Lord Jesus Christ. All of us are enrolled in a school. And in that curriculum, we all fail. The issue is not to run away from that reality, but rather how to deal with it in a responsible way so that you are not kept abey. And yet, unfortunately, we tend to talk about the failures of others. Suddenly, it becomes headline news. We talk about it in town at our dinner tables. It boosts our ratings in the newspapers, boss websites. It becomes the subject of sermons. And today, WhatsApp is one popular medium of sharing other people's failures. We don't talk about our own because... When you own up to your own, there is gossip, there is humiliation, unkindness, retribution, cruel treatment. Africans need to come to terms with this. Yes, we may be failing in many respects, but we are not the only countries that have failed in the past. But the subject ought to be, how do we deal with it in, in order that we are not stuck there? One reason I've discovered people don't want to talk about failure is even when you own up to your failure, suddenly there is rejection. You are treated as if you have HIV, AIDS, or Ebola. There is slander, false accusation, half truths. In religious circles, a person who fails is treated as Cain. You have a mark on your head. A Jezebel, if you are a woman. A Judas. People think you've committed an unpardonable sin against the Holy Spirit and you are doomed for eternal damnation. I, I have to skip a, a lot of things uh, uh, for lack of time. But here's the point. We must talk about failure. Not that we should dwell on it, but rather, if you have failed in one area, your studies, your business, your marriage, 
whatever area, if you have failed and somehow by the grace of God you have overcome certain things, you owe it as a duty to share it with others so that they may learn from your experiences, avoid the mistakes you did, and also be enriched by how you bounce back. In fact, the Bible can be seen as a book on failure. Right from the first human beings who were created in a perfect environment, Adam and Eve, they failed. Noah failed. Abraham failed. Give me your Bible characters. They all failed. So you can now start reading the Bible as a book of failures. Instructing us on how others failed, how some of them overcame it, and what to avoid and what to do when we also experience our own. We need to talk about failure. In fact, David, after his adultery and murder, and then his penitential prayer, Psalm 51, as you read the prayer from verse 1 to verse 12, Lord, have mercy upon me, I have shed blood, etc., etc. Then in verse 13, he says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted. What David is saying is, Lord, after you have forgiven me, after I become a different person, I am going to talk about it. So the book of Psalms and some of the uh, uh, songs written by David, which are scattered in the Bible in different forms, are all testimony of we needing to learn from him. King Solomon, after messing up big time, he wrote the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, all to instruct us of, our, of his experiences. Jesus told Simon in Luke 22, 31 to 32, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he's going to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brothers. In other words, Jesus says, look, Peter, you are going to fail. But you will bounce back. And after you bounce back, go forth and tell others about it. My question is, why don't we talk about failure? Ellen White wrote in the book, Ministry of Healing, you must help those who have erred by telling them of your experiences. Show how, when you made grave mistakes, patience, kindness, and helpfulness on the part of your fellow workers gave you courage and hope. Indeed, I experienced failure. But ladies and gentlemen, I am here to tell you that failure is not final. One of the phrases I'll keep telling is, after failure empties your cup, God's grace can fill it to the brim again. And so for the next few minutes, I want you to, 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 to loosen up. You are not here to impress anyone. Wake up. We are dealing with realities of life. If you haven't experienced some mega failures in your business, in your workplace, in your family, in your relationship, it is going to happen sooner or later. So now is the time to begin learning from others. Those who have been in the hospital ahead of you, ask them and they would help you. So in the next couple of minutes, let me share with you at least seven points on how to deal with failure responsibly, I will dwell on the last one because that is where the mindset issue would be highlighted. So here, here are the points. The, the, the first one, I will just read a couple of quotes to you. If you really want to deal with your failure, if you want to bounce back after any failure, business failure, academic failure, you must have a different perspective on failure. See, because failure uh, tends to be painful, many of us think it is so bad that we ought to recoil into our shell. Somebody says, William Brown, failure is an event. It is never a person. Failure is an attitude. It is not an outcome. Pause. This is a revolutionary thought. Failure is an event. It is not a person. The fact that you have failed an exam or a job interview, an event, 
doesn't mean you are a failure, your personhood. Failure is not an outcome. Not passing a class, a loss of business, breakup of relationship, loss of health. Rather, failure is an aptitude. Never think you are a failure. You may have failed in something, but it does not mean failure is stamped on you. Am, am I making sense? These are what some people who have gone through failure have bequeathed unto us. Failure is an event, never a person. Someone also says, there is no failure, only a feedback. That makes sense. Failure is a feedback. It's an input on your performance thus far. And it tells you how you should proceed. So, you broke up with your girlfriend or boyfriend. And so what? It only means something didn't go well. So, you are getting an immediate feedback. So that you know how to proceed subsequently. Another person says... Look at failure as a stumble that prevents a fall. See, a true fall, you are basically down. But this is just a stumble. Failure is the cloud that temporarily hides the sun. It is not the death or obliteration of the sun. As you walk in the day light and then you see clouds you know shielding you from the sun and you may not see the sun clearly it doesn't mean the sun is dead failure is the cloud that temporarily hides the sun it is not the death or obliteration of the sun someone says this the class says failure is a detour not a dead end straight henry four says failure is not it's only the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. You were stupid in the first instance. Now, start anew. I, I, I read together. If you want to overcome failure, the first thing is have a different perspective on failure so that you are not paralyzed by it. From these uh, quotes I've given you, what is clear is failure is not or ought not, or ought not be permanent. You can always bounce back. You can always rise onto the road of success. The second thing to do if you are confronted with failure is to recognize that you are not alone. See, sometimes you think you are the only person who has failed. Yesterday, I was talking with a friend of mine and his wife, and uh, we were having some lively conversations. Someone who was doing tremendously well, and then uh, she hit some roadblocks, and then she was crying, and then something swelled at me. He said, shut up, stop crying. You are not the only person who have gone through this. And so we plunged into a whole debate that myself and the crew we were staying together with. You know, sometimes you think we are the only people who have suffered failure. No, you are not. And in fact, you will not be the last person. Until Jesus comes, everyone would fail. So when you fail, take a deep breath. Ever since Adam, everyone had been failing. Some big ones, small ones, secret, public, but it is all there. You don't own the patent right to failure. If you do fail, be encouraged by the fact that there are many in your days who have failed, and long after you are gone, there will be many more. The real issue is, what do you do with your failure? I'll skip some to some Bible characters are saints, St. Saint Peter, St. Saint Paul, St. Saint whatever. <laughs> what you don't know is all these saints have some dark past. So what's your problem? See, we must come to that point where we, 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 we must not pacify or, or uh, comfort ourselves. Oh, poor me, I'm from a village, I'm from a poor home, broken home, I've suffered this. No, 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 no. You are not alone. Many others have gone through it before. If that's clear, say amen. You need to believe that your failure can actually lead you to success. Time will not allow me to uh, chronicle for you some of the greatest accomplishments 
in, by individuals in the world, I would have listed from the 18th to 19th, 20th century, individuals who have failed, and yet they turned their failures around and it became incredible success. Benjamin Franklin said, I didn't just fail the test, I found 100 ways to do it wrong. That makes perfect sense. The idea is that even if you try and fail, it doesn't mean you didn't learn something. You have learned something, how not to do it wrong the last time. In fact, uh, Thomas Edison said the same, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. And so you don't repeat it. That leads me to point number four. I'm rolling through uh, very fast. Um, I've already mentioned to bounce back from failure, you must have a different perspective from failure. You must recognize that you are not alone. Believe that your failure can lead to success. And the fourth point is you must develop a positive attitude or disposition towards failure. Here's what somebody says. One who makes no mistakes never makes anything. If you are seated here and said, I don't want to make any mistake, then chances are you are doing nothing and you will be doing nothing. A person who never made a mistake had never tried anything new. Albert Einstein says the same. My mother who grew up in the village says, it is the one who fetches the water from the stream, you know, who breaks the pot. We have these even pots and then we go to the riverside, fetch water. And she says, the person who goes to the stream often sometimes trips and falls. So if you have never broken a pot, chances are you are doing nothing. Lloyd-Jones says, the men who try to do something and fail are infinitely better than those who try to do nothing and succeed. Think about it. If you are actively engaged in something and you make mistakes, you are better than the person who does nothing and makes no mistakes at all. My mother says you cannot eat an egg without breaking the shell. What she's trying to say is success is like eating eggs. But in order to eat eggs, you have to break some shells. Failure is part of the effort, in every effort to accomplish something great, there would be mistakes. So develop a positive attitude. Another point uh, I would mention is be thankful for failure. Somewhere in the Bible says, in all things, you know, with prayer and thanksgiving, give glory to God, give thanks to God. Thank God also for failure, for your misfortunes, for defeats. I wrote a piece some time ago titled, Fortunes of Misfortunes. And I made a case that embedded in the word misfortune is the word fortune. It is fortune that is missed. Misfortunes are the fortunes missed by the proud, careless, and ungrateful, or people who are not observant. Tomorrow's fortunes are enveloped in today's misfortunes. And so let us redeem the hidden wealth by developing attitudes of gratitude for life's necessity. I, I wish I could tell you some things that happened after I experienced my failure, as painful as they were. They opened my eyes to realities, to my own vulnerabilities, and also opportunities that I never saw in the past. Someone said, I think it's Michael Youssef, who said there can be no triumph unless there is a trial. There can be no testimony unless there is a test. There can be no conquest unless there is a conflict. Notice that the word trial is hidden in the word triumph. The word test is embedded in the word testimony, and the word conflict is concealed. Thankful for your failures. There is a whole chapter in the book of Psalms that deals with failure, and basically it says, be thankful for failure. I'm not preaching, so I'm not going to preach that to you. Failure often softens our heart. 
It helps us to develop maturity. It broadens our thinking. It offers insights. It prompts innovation. It reveals ability. It inspires, reinforces the need for risk. It builds courage, fortifies, opens up opportunities. It brings unexpected benefits. It pushes the envelope of future performance. It liberates, it makes success sweeter, and it's preferable to bitterness and regret. This is what one person has said. Be thankful for failure. I'm slowly heading to point number seven, which is where I'm going to talk about the mindset. Another thing to do to quickly bounce out of failure is avoid self-pity. You see, failure hurts. And because it hurts, because it is painful, we almost invariably relapse in self-pity. Self-pity refuses to take ownership of its failures. It tries to deny, to cover up, excuse, blame, or accuse others. Self-pity, Elizabeth Elliot says, is a death that has no resurrection. It is a sinkhole from which no rescuing hand can drag you because you have chosen to sink. Many of us, quite frankly, are wallowing in self-pity. Self-pity is dangerous because it is self-centered. It is a form of pride. But this pride, unlike the big-time pride where you are proud because of your success, you are good-looking, you've accomplished, but that is big-time pride. But self-pity is another form of pride which says, hey, come and look at me. I have suffered so much. Big time pride says, look at me. I have accomplished so much. Self-pity is the pride of the weak, the pride of the ugly, the pride of the oppressed. Self-pity is the pride of the weak and suffering. It is a more subtle form of pride because while pretending to be very needy, it is actually crying for attention. It is delusional. It is crazy. Because it sees itself as a victim for its own failures and mistakes. And when self-pity refuses to acknowledge its low form condition, it is incurable and deadly. So how do you deal with failure without wallowing in self-pity? I'll give you six quick points. Graciously accept your defeat. Okay, I messed up. I failed the exam. My marriage has fallen apart. Own up. Accept it. Number two, humbly admit your own failure. Own it. Own the failures. Offer no excuses for your faults. Accept the consequences. Pay the price when necessary. Learn from your missteps and surrender your hopes to God because God can turn those things around. Those are six ways you can deal with failure responsibly. I want you us to live here with a new healthy attitude towards failure. Let me wrap up before I go to the seventh point where I really want to learn. Have a different perspective on failure. Recognize that you are not alone. Believe that your failure can lead to success. Develop a positive attitude towards failure. Be thankful for failure. Avoid self-pity. And then the seventh point, get up quickly and keep going. Get up quickly and keep on going. This is the winsome mindset we need to. After you've been beaten by failure and, and then you wash your face, get up and keep going. Uh, Thomas Edison, our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is to try just one more time. So as soon as you fail, get up immediately. Don't waste time on the floor. Brush off the deck and keep going. Uh, I, I wrote a book, I think I mentioned it, Six More Chances. And in one of uh, the chapters, I retold the story of the, the old donkey uh, that was abandoned. A farmer had an old donkey. It fell into its abandoned well. And then the farmer had the brain, the crying of this donkey desperately, you know, 
beaten up, battered and bruised, come and help him. The farmer sympathized with the donkey, but after carefully assessing the situation, he said some of his friends in the, in the, in the farm area said he has fallen into this pit, this hole, this well, and I cannot pull it out. In fact, I don't need to because the donkey is of no longer of any use to me. So come and help me put it out of its misery by uh, digging some dirt and then pulling it into the hole. And so they came. Everyone had this shovel. They dug some dirt and then threw it into the well. And as it hit the donkey, the donkey started crying out even more, looking upset, waiting for help. Please help me, I'm a Ghanaian donkey. But the donkey discovered that no amount of crying would help it. So an idea crossed it. Each that that was howled at it, hitting it at the back, it decided I would just shake it off and step on the dirt. And so that is what the donkey did. Every howl of dirt, after it hit it out, after the initial pain, it would shake it off and then step on it. Shake it off, step on it. Shake it off, step on it. He translated the pain, the panic, into shake it off, step on it. And it wasn't long before, because with every step on the bed, the, 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 the length of the, the donkey to the, uh, uh, the exit grew shorter and shorter. And soon, that old donkey, which had been battered and exhausted, stepped out triumphantly over the wall, and it had an important lesson to all the human beings there. An important lesson on how to overcome adversity was shake it off and step on it. See, here's the point. Life is going to dig debt on you. All kinds of debt. See, I am older than many of you. I'm old age positive. You are younger. As you grow older, you are going to discover life is not what you make it out to be. Life is going to shovel death on you, all kinds of death. The trick to getting out of the well is not to let it bury you, but to shake it off and step on it. Each of our troubles or setbacks is a stepping stone. I wrote a thought nugget some time ago, and the point I said is setbacks shouldn't set you back. They are stepping stones. Step on the stones and you will look upward and forward. Ellen White says, opposing circumstances should create a firm determination to overcome them. What she says is, any problem you face, it must make you more determined to overcome it. The breaking down of one barrier will give greater ability and courage to go forward. Press with determination in the right direction and circumstances will be your helpers, not your hindrances. I like that last phrase. Circumstances will be your helpers, not your hindrances. And this is what transition me to the mindset. The idea of getting up See, the, the Japanese have a saying which says, fall seven times and stand up eight. This is the philosophy of Japan which they have translated into many of their activities from their engineering, martial arts, everything, fall seven times, stand up eight. It is a philosophy of resilience. It is a philosophy of determination. No matter how many times you get knocked down, you must keep getting up. And as I said, it has been ingrained in Japanese culture to embrace business, education, sports, martial arts. The basic message is, if you are a Japanese, you may get knocked down, but keep getting up. 
And that is precisely the same message the Bible teaches. In fact, it is repeated so many times in the Bible. Proverbs 24, 16. A righteous man shall fall seven times, but rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. If a righteous man rises again after falling seven times, the implication, mathematically speaking, is that when he first fell, he had six more chances left. That's how I titled the book, Six More Chances. So if you have failed once, you failed your chemistry, your English, and so what? You have more chances. Get up and keep trying. I don't want to be misunderstood. I am not saying that this passage gives us license to keep falling. I'm simply saying, if you fall, don't despair. Get up. Your one big fall is not the end of you. You have six more chances. A righteous man falls seven times, rises again. The wicked shall fall by calamity. Both the righteous and the wicked fall. Everyone fails. The difference between the wicked and the righteous is one person keeps rising, and that's why they keep falling. Proverbs 24, 16. That's where the idea, the six more chances mindset comes in. Micah, a prophet in the Old Testament. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. Talking about uplift. I will keep getting up. When I sit in the darkness, the Lord will be my light. These are revolutionary concepts. Refuse to accept failure as final. As I said, when failure empties your cup, God's grace can fill it to the brim again. David says, Psalm 37, 23, 24, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he falls, he shall not be utterly cast down. Implication, he will rise after falling. Why? The Lord upholds him with his hand. Job chapter 5, 19. He shall deliver you in six troubles. Yea, yes, in seven. No evil shall touch you. I can give you many, many Bible texts, but I'm skipping a number of them. The point I am making is keep rising. Don't get stuck there. Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Notice, many, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Paul, the text we read earlier, and I think on Saturday when I talk about the can-do mindset, Ephesians 3, 20, And to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. And in this, we see the power. Where does the power? God is able. What is he able to do? He is able to do what we ask. You know, you can have your friends, family members, you want to ask them for help. <laughs> they are not able, but God is able. Even those who are able, you ask them, they won't give you. But our God is able to do what we ask. And not only that, the text says he's able to do what we ask or think. Even the things you haven't told the Lord, he is able to do even that. And the text didn't end there, as I showed. God is able to do all that we ask or think. It didn't end there. He is able to do above all that we ask or think. No, he is able to do, the text says, abundantly above all that we ask or think. And then the other line, he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think. Because he has the power. And it is this power that is available to us. And so refuse to settle for your failure as if that is a dead end. No, it is not. Paul says, we have hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, not forsaken, stuck down, not destroyed. As I said earlier, some version says, we may be knocked down, but we are never knocked out. We get knocked down, but we get up again. Outwardly, we may be troubled on every side. Inwardly, we refuse to be distressed. Persecuted, not forsaken. You may be at the end of your rope, but not the end of hope. God is able to do the best when we are at our worst. He can at all times. He's at work. You want the evidence? 
Adam was down, God lifted him. Jacob was down, God lifted him. Joseph was down, God lifted him. Moses, Miriam, Aaron, David, Samson, Elijah, Ezekiel, Mary Magdalene, Peter. God is able, and this is the key thought, God knows how to lift us up, uplift. He knows how to lift us up out of predicaments. He knows how to fix our broken worlds, our broken hearts, our broken hopes, broken homes, and broken health. There is not a problem God cannot fix. He brings beauty out of the ugly situations, new growth out of ash heaps, sweet smelling life out of foul smelling rottenness. After failure empties your cup, God's grace can fill it to the brim again. And what we have just enunciated in the first few minutes is duplicated in real life. When Coca-Cola started, they sold only 400 bottles. People thought they were done. But today, a ball player, when he was in high school, they cut him out of basketball. They said he was no good. He ended up being one of the best, if not the best, basketball. Dr. Seuss, who published many books for little kids, he submitted it to publishers, 23 publishers. They turned it down. The 24th took it, and now it's a multi-million publishing enterprise. Elvis Presley, you know, rock and roll industries. He was banished from, you know, um, the Grand Ole Opera. After one performance, they told him, you ain't going nowhere, son. You are no good. He proved them wrong. Oprah Winfrey, he was fired from his television reporter's job and advised, you are not fit for TV. She didn't accept it. Now she has proved them wrong. Henry Ford had two failed businesses before he became a pioneer in the automotive industry. Spain Bielbeck, I can go on. Steve Jobs, the one who has revolutionized the, the, the computer industry. He started his own company. He was fired. Fifteen years later, he came back, revived it, and he revolutionized the letter I. You know, the letter I of the uh, alphabet, it looks so insignificant, one tiny little man with a little dot. And he took that letter I and revolutionized it. So now we have iMac, iTunes, iPod, iPad, iPhone, iCloud. And someone says, when he died, he went to the clouds to continue directing affairs in the world. I, he refused. So what am I saying? I'm quoting these ends and then I'm done. What should you do with failure? Try and fail, but don't fail to try. A life spent making mistakes is not only honorable, but more useful than a life spent doing nothing. Stumbling is not falling. I'm just quoting proverbs from different people in different places. Fall seven times, stand up eight. Our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. There is no such thing as failure. It is just a temporary postponement of success. And I like this one better. If you know you are going to fail, fail gloriously. That is failure with an attitude. It is how you deal with failure that determines whether you accomplish success. And Abraham Lincoln said, my great concern is not whether you have failed, but whether you are content with your failure. And one of our fellows here yesterday, he was talking to me, said, failure is manure to mature. Just run. And the last one, Richard Nixon, a man who had made failure, his, I mean, he's known in America, one of the former presidents who was forced to resign. Defeat doesn't finish a man. It is quitting. A man is not finished when he is defeated. He is finished when he quits. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a mindset that refuses to accept failure as final. Refuse it. And don't wallow in self-pity as if you have accomplished much by, by, by crying and pretending that your world has collapsed. No. Others, before you have gone through it, many have bounced back. You can do the same. Africa needs a generation of men and women who refuse to accept any form of failure as final. We can learn from it take ownership from it and rise up 
and make a difference. The Lord being our help, each one of us, by the grace of God, can rise up and your end may be even far more glorious than your past. This is the Africa and the Africans we want to see. May the Lord richly bless each one of you. Let us rise up as, as we pray because um, in the coming years, you'll be seeing a lot of works from my pen on failure because I've discovered this is a, a subject that is not explored. And so we'll be exploring this subject a little further, different aspects of failure. But the Lord is going to help us. As we walk out of this place, go forth by faith. Go forth with a firm determination. Have you lost your job? That shouldn't be the end. Look for other options. Have you been denied admission to school? Look for other options. Perhaps the time you are staying at home. Use the internet. YouTube is a whole school. Major universities from Harvard, Yale, also, they are putting their whole curriculum online. Don't just stay home. Use that time to study. There is a lot we can do with our failure. Failure is never final. Failure is not a dead end. And after failure empties your cup, God's grace will fill it to the brim again. I wish I could just open the Bible for you to see things perhaps you've never seen before because it took failure for me to start seeing things in the Bible I never saw before. Nebuchadnezzar, big time failure. He was reduced into an animal. And then the Bible tells us, go and read it, Daniel chapter 4, verse 34 and 36. It said, at the end of those years, seven years, he said, I lifted up my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. My reason returned to me. My counselors resorted to me. Excellent majesty was added to me. In other words, at the end of failure, his days far exceeded what he had. That is the African kind of mindset we need. Your future will be far more glorious than the present. By standing up, you are saying you refuse to be held captive to any form of failure. The Lord will be your help. He has been my help. And I can give you many others whom God has helped. Don't be intimidated by the pain, the humiliation, the shame, the hurt, the attacks. No, no, no. You are bigger than that. Your God is bigger than that. He'll give you the help. And I want to believe at the next year's uplift, you are coming to share testimony that after your business failure, you left this place determined and the Lord helped you. After doors were shut in your face, after your relationship, your marriage failure, you happen somehow bounce back in something that is far more glorious. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, tonight we've been talking about mindset. You've spoken to us through the judge about changing our mindset in our workplace on the issue of integrity, that we can go against the grain of corruption and make a difference. You've spoken to us through an earlier speaker, but there are so many things we believe that are not true. We have failed to question them. The time has come for us to start challenging those things. So we can have new mindsets that will transform our lives. And now we have talked about a mindset that can transform our failures into successes. Help each one of us. You know the areas in our lives that we have failed. Where we are failing. Help us not to be stuck there. And Lord, you know that one of the most painful areas of failure is spiritual failure. And many of us dare not, because sometimes even religious folks are more vicious in the attack of their fellows. Help us, Lord, to seek refuge in you, 
your word tells us if any of us has failed, if any of us has sinned, when we confess to you, you are faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us of all righteousness. You bid us say, my little children, I write unto you so that you do not sin, you do not fail. But if anyone sins, if anyone fails, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He would help us. Lord, by standing us, we are saying, help each one of us overcome our personal failures, financial failures, spiritual failures, academic failures, job failures, every other form of failure. And may we go forth as ambassadors of your redeeming love, your pardoning, cleansing, and sustaining grace. Let this be our experience as we are each uplifted from our predicament. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. this is so humbling if you are here and your mind your soul has not been renewed and revived and I think like Doc said you need to shake it off and step on it please let's clap for him again thank you very much Doc God bless you so much Right. Then, I'll call someone from the coordinator's desk to come and give us the announcements.